Welcome. Thanks for being here. So uh, who here stayed up and watched the whole game last night? Wow. How about that? Now, who went to bed like I did and thought, nah. And then this morning, oh my gosh, what a surprise. And what a blessing we had this set for tonight. As if we had seen the future and knew that this would be a travel day. And uh, so thank you for being here, everybody. Um, I've been looking forward to this time for several weeks because I know that many of you have been trying to connect some dots and you're having a hard time connecting some dots and it manifests because you come running out to, to me and or other people on the staff and you're like, I, I think something's different and that doesn't feel right. And, and we decided, you know what, we, we, we need to bring everybody in on a journey that we have been taking um, here in the recent few months. And so that's what I'm going to do um, this evening is to try to bring you through what has been more than 50 hours of sitting in a room with our lead team and working, collaborating, brainstorming, and all of these sorts of things. But I don't want to just give you uh, information. I want you to feel inspiration. And so really what we're driving towards, just so you can know, so how's the plane going to land? The, um, we're going to move into a time of what we call Scripture-fed, Spirit-led, worship-based prayer. Um, and that's where we're going to move towards. But um, before we get to that, I want to just kind of take you through uh, some of the process that we've been going through so that we'll all be on the same page and say, now I get it. And uh, so let me say a prayer and we'll get going. Lord, thank you for each person who's here for their willingness to uh, carve out some time this evening um, to come here for some time of prayer and worship and information, just talking about the things that you're doing. It's exciting, God, when we get to be in the midst of the waves of your Holy Spirit just stirring and working. And we have the distinct awareness that we're right there again. And it's exciting us. And we're very, very grateful. I thank you, God, for each person who's here. We have all sorts of influencers here um, not even only leaders, but certainly a lot of leaders, but other people who maybe aren't in a season of leading, maybe they were in a season of leading somewhere in the past, but they still have a lot of influence around here. Just because maybe they've been here for a lot of years, they know a lot of people, um, and they still rub elbows with so many people. And so uh, thanks for just all of our influencers who are here. Once you come now, Holy Spirit, lead us along um, in this time. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I told you back in the spring about sort of this revival of the soul that God had been working in me and shaking me out of this sort of sleepwalking in the faith thing that I was just sort of going through the motions and bringing me back to life. The number one question that people came up asking me is, this is great, praise the Lord, I'm so glad God's working in you. What does that mean for the church? To which I said, I don't know yet, but we're gonna get it figured out. And so I began to have day-long meetings with the lead team in which we were doing a lot of praying and searching and whiteboarding and, and um, just concepting. And then I got talking with some other pastor friends around the country, who some of whom are a, a few stages ahead of me in life that are mentors and shaping me. And I began to pick up on a theme. And the theme is sometimes, Ken, 
it's better if you actually get somebody from outside your system to come in with a fresh set of eyes who just spends his or her life in church world. That's just what they do. They're consultants for, for growing churches. And there was this one group in particular that just kept coming up in these conversations called intentional churches. So I gave them a call and I said, hey, I keep hearing about you and I want to hear what do you do? And so they began to tell me, here's the process that we lead staffs through who are uh, trying to figure out kind of what is the Lord doing? Because they said, we can't tell you what, but we can lead you through a process to help you kind of pull out because you probably already are dancing around it. You just haven't quite got it figured out. I said, I think that's probably a very good assessment. So we interviewed them and we hired them. And I can say in no uncertain terms, it's the best consulting decision I think we ever made. Um, the time has been so helpful and it's not over. We're still in a season where they come back and, and we're doing these progress reports and this kind of thing for a year. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, um, we've been really spending time talking about faith bridge and where we are, where we've come from, where we're going. What does God want from us? Um, what is the Holy Spirit on the move doing? Because we want to be in the midst of all of that. I would describe the experience that we've been uh, going through as sort of to use a car metaphor that I know nothing about, but um, sort of opening up the hood and taking everything out of all those things that are under a hood and setting them all out on the concrete and shining them up and throwing out the bad ones and putting in the new ones that you need and then to start to rebuild it into a lot better, healthier, more functional um, car. I would say that is the process, and we're not through the process, but we're enough through it that we f thought, like I said when I started, we better bring our leaders in and, and sort of bring everybody um, along. I'll tell you in no uncertain terms, we, though, have the very clear sense that God is moving and we're seeing our uh, potential for the days ahead with a clarity that we haven't seen in a long time. And um, so let me show you um, what the, uh, the problem is. Um, the problem is the life cycle that every organization, every, well, that's just what every person in the whole wide world and every organization goes through. You're, you're, you go through a season of growth and then you get to uh, sort of this plateau and it's at this point that you either need to find a new S-curve or you begin the process of dying. And there's plenty of churches uh, dotting the landscape uh, of our nation that have uh, gone right down that. So they uh, came in. They've done a lot of analytics on us and everything. They came in and they said, okay, well... We, we're just going to get right to the point and tell you a, a problem that we see. You're plateaued. You've been plateaued at roughly 3,300 people on a weekend now for about five years. Um, is that not a concern? And we're like, nope, not a concern in the world because uh, we're spiritual people. We don't get into numbers. And, and they said, said, wait a second. Jesus is the one who got into numbers that, because each one of these numbers is a soul. That cannot be, you cannot be that passive uh, about everything. We said, yeah, but hey, wait a second. We're not that bad. And we pointed out our kids' ministry. We've got this most amazing kids' ministry. They're like, you do. You are killing it in kids' ministry. And you should see our FSM, our student ministry. It's amazing. Yeah, you grid out way good on your student ministry. And then have you looked at the road? They're like, oh my gosh, yes, this church is probably one of the two most missional churches we've ever worked with. That is not your problem. 
We said, and then have you heard of Bridging for Tomorrow? Yeah, we saw all that. We read all about your Bridging for Tomorrow, all that Title I stuff that you do. Down. That's an impressive operation, what you've got going on. And our grow groups and our discipleship micro groups, aren't you, you know, give us some brownie points for those. Yeah, cl clearly you've made a concerted effort over the last five or six years to bring a lot greater health and functionality um, to all of your adult ministry grow groups um, along the way. That's not your problem. We're like, okay. They said, but here's the deal. You've got to deal with this. Because if you don't deal with this, it would be like you saying, look at this. My hands work great. I have no aches or pains or arthritis. My knees work great. I can still run. My heart's doing great. I get up to my target heart rate. I hardly ever have any headaches. I'm just really, really doing well. With this one little exception, I have a touch of cancer. Now, if that is what you say, that's the problem, right? Doesn't matter how these other things are doing because you got a problem, and they said, this is your problem, that you're, you've got this plateau thing going on, and you're choosing not to look at it and to deal with it. And, and these, are, these are wonderful people that have come into the kingdom, and, and they've trusted Christ, and, and they're growing. But we've looked at your demographics, and you've got tens of thousands, hundred thousand right around here. And uh, you got to deal with the fact that you're not growing. We're like, okay, you, you've, you've, you've convinced us. Um, they said, now we're going to let you in on a little secret that will help interpret this for you. When you started the church, people came to church more often than they do now. We're like, we thought we were seeing that. And they said, oh, we can guarantee you that you're seeing that. It's for this reason primarily. When we started the church 19 years ago, we were still within the realm of sort of the, the Christian culture. The pendulum has been swinging, if you haven't noticed, and we are increasingly living in a post-Christian world. Now, right here in the suburbs of Spring, Texas, used to be when we started the church, many people still had on their list of things they needed to get around to, I need to find a church. That isn't even on people's list anymore. They just... Church, why would I do that? I just, I that thought never crossed my mind. So you're going to have fewer people who are just going to be coming and exploring on their own. But even of your committed people, people are traveling more than ever. They got sports leagues more than ever. Um, the internet and just technology brings it to them. They're like, you know, we just decided to stay in our pajamas today, and, and, but we were there, you know. And, and so there's all these dynamics at play. So let us tell you what's going on. When you started, the average um, attendance for church was two out of four Sundays. On general, in general, your people would come two out of four times in a month, right? So if you were going to be a church of 3,300 on a weekend, that meant that realistically, um, you were probably a, a church of about 6,600. They said, how big do you think you are? And I said, that's funny because that's about exactly, I tend to say we're probably about 6,600, 6,000, 7,000, somewhere in there, and we see about half of them every week. And they said, nope, that ain't the way it works anymore. Now, the average is one out of four. Um, I'm not saying you all, because I'm sure you all are four out of four, right? Um, but I'm just saying that there are these people that don't, they're not four out of four anymore. They're not three, they're not two, they're one out of four. And the truth is you got one out of eight and one out of 12 that pulls your averages. So this now means something. Let's do the math. They said, so now if you're averaging that many, realistically, you got to realize you are, are a church that is probably right in this range. You probably have 10 to 12,000 people in the community that say, oh, I'm a faith bridger. 
Sort of like the guy and the gal that came out years ago. It was a Christmas Eve service, and they came out and hugged me and said, oh, my gosh, that was amazing. And we just cried, and we felt God. It was awesome. And we'll see you on Easter. You know, and, and I was like, wow. And they were serious, and that's just how they thought. And so, um, so we're their church, but we just won't see them very much. And so they said, so this can give you some interpretation to uh, what's going on. The fact that you're holding even means that, that probably your denominator has grown. But you can't settle for that. You can't settle for that because there are still churches in this post-Christian world that are growing, that you know, are moving from 3,300 to 3,800, crossing the 400,000 barrier, uh, you know, and, and, and so so you, you can't settle for that. Said there's basically two ways that you um, could accomplish a goal. They said, let's just say for kicks, the goal is doubling your impact in the next five years. We're like, that sounds exciting, doubling your impact in the next five years. Twice as many groups, twice as many uh, micro groups, twice as many mission trips, twice as many people. So they said, okay, so that means if you were going to see 6,600 people from week to week, you realize, well, let's just round down, you realize that really means now you've got to get a lot more people into the funnel, like somewhere around that many people who are coming in, who you are working to connect into grow groups and to serve teams and you know, if you can figure out a way to hack into their iPhones and change their schedules and you get them to come two times a month, great. You can close that gap even faster, um, but realistically, we're not able to do that. So, so this is p something that um, you're just going to have to really kind of realize is, is reality and, and this is um, something we're going to have to look at. So... Um, they said, um, what else do you think could be reasons for t t a plateau? And we said, well, our facilities, we, we, we postpone kind of doing one building, this, and they're like, how many square feet do you have? And we said, 130,000. They're like, nope, that ain't the reason. And they had this little tabulator deal, this spreadsheet. They're like, 130,000 square feet, you can have a campus of five to 6,000 people, easy. That's doable. I asked Bill Carpenter. Bill, are you here? Um, there he is. Who built all these buildings? And he's like, these buildings are built. This campus is built for five to six thousand. So we confirm that. So we went through some other things, and then finally they said, "Okay, so how are you doing on baptisms?" We're like baptisms. Yeah, baptisms. Uh, like new people trusting in Christ. That's right. That's right. How are you doing on that? We had to say, you know, we used to have new people coming all the time and all these great stories and people getting baptized left and right. And, and that isn't happening like it used to happen. Not at the frequency that it used to happen. They said, okay. We think maybe we're uh, kind of zeroing in on something that we're going to need to... Um, uh, to, to look at. They said, why don't you think that you're having as many baptisms in, in professions of faith? We said, well, maybe it's because five or six years ago we set our sights on discipleship. And we said, we're going to get people in discipleship groups and we're going to really grow them because then if you really grow them, then they'll go spinning out and they'll bring in more people and because they're such great disciples. And they said, Okay, that's a half good strategy. It's half good in that, yes, we want to make discipleship. Yes, you need to take people deeper. It's a bad strategy if that is your evangelism strategy because they said statistics show that if you pluck a person out from his or her secular world where he was and you put him into a little cluster of Christians now and that becomes his friends, that he is losing, she is losing contact with those people that they used to have street cred with, that they could have brought in. 
So that cannot be your strategy for evangelism. We'll just invest in them here. We'll send them out two years later. No, they're going to get very comfortable in, that, in those groups is what's going to happen. We said, you know, that's kind of what we think is happening. They said, oh, yeah, we can tell you that's exactly what's going on here. Um, and <clears throat> so at that point, they said, okay, we need to just go back to sort of Vince Lombardi uh, style. This is a football. They, they said, now, what did Jesus come into the world to do? 1 Timothy 1.15, he came into the world to save sinners. We're like, got it, to save sinners, right? Matthew 11.19, in fact, Jesus spent most of his time with the sinners to the disgust of all the self-righteous church people. And he said things like, it's the sick people who need a doctor, not the healthy people. So he came to call the sinners to repentance. Mark 9, Mark 2 rather, Matthew 9, Luke 5. And then Jesus even illustrated it. Think about this for, for just a second. When did he say was the one time that the champagne bottles of heaven get uncorked? It's not when Johnny had his third quiet time in a row for three straight days. No, it's when one lost one comes home. And he tells those three famous stories in Luke 15. He starts with the 100 sheep. There was 100 sheep. And the shepherd went out and he was counting them, 96, 97, 98, 99, 96, 97, Oh my gosh, we've lost one. And he left the 99 and he went after the one. And when he found the one, there was more rejoicing in heaven. The angels, celebration. And then he moves to the lady that had the 10 coins. Seven, eight, nine, I've lost one. Where is it? Sweeps the whole house, finally founds it. More rejoicing in heaven. Woo, party. We found it. A father who had two sons. One who goes off to a far place. But then one day he comes to his senses and he turns around and he comes back home. And what's the father do? Party! He was more concerned about that than the one. They said, we're going to make an assessment of you all. You're doing a great ministry and yes, you've got these high point things that are going on and, and that's awesome. Keep doing that. But you've got a cancer and you're going to have to deal with this. You've grown apathetic towards the one. You've gotten very comfortable with the 99. You're running through your grid all the time. What would the 99 think if we did this? They wouldn't like it. Okay, then we won't do it. Because you're trying to please the 99. You're not focused on the one. But you couldn't have gotten to the point that you've gotten to that way. Tell us your story. I said, like, the very beginning story? They're like, yeah. I'm he, he said, I'm sure they've heard you tell it before. And I'm like, oh, boy, have they ever heard me tell it before? I said, so I got here, and I lived in this apartment. I was by myself, and I had this friend, uh, Shannon and David, and I took them to dinner, and I convinced them. And then we tripled that night, and they came, and then they had a party, and they invited some people, and they came along, and then they had a party, and they invited some people, and we went, and we just kept having these parties, and we were just sort of doing this, um, you know, strategy that we had seen Matthew did when Matthew, the tax collector, became... Um, a follower, and the first people that he invited were his tax collector friends. They're like, you still doing those? No, we haven't done those in a long time. Hmm. Sounded like they were really working, and you were reaching people, right? We're like, yeah. And people were coming in, and they were meeting Jesus, and their lives were changing, like real-life people, like Rick and Peggy Burden. Real-life people like Kelly and Curtis Hickey. Real-life people who, they, they'd never connected the dots spiritually, but they came in and they experienced, you know, this, this, the powerful thing that was going on on Sunday mornings and the worship and the prayer and the authenticity, and they're like, wow, 
I'm feeling something that I haven't felt, and this is very real, and I've got to pay attention to this. And the dots were getting connected in their souls, and then they would get plugged in to a grow group and a serve team, and then they'd go running out, and they'd get their friends, and they'd bring their, you've got to come to this place where God is doing some things, and they would bring their people, and then they would have a story like that, and then they would run out and bring their people and, and that sort of thing. And so they said, okay. This is very enlightening. So they said, let us tell you what we're seeing um, in three circles. Everything that you've said revolves um, around three circles. You had this powerful friend-to-friend thing that was going on. Like every week people were bringing new people with them. They're like, we're willing to bet that your leaders, your influencers, they're not bringing people with them anymore. I'm not going to have you raise your hand. If you, okay, so, um, so I said, okay, that is probably true. They said, now, there is probably a reason that they're not, and that is that the Sunday experience, something about the Sunday experience is not resonating in a way that they're like, we got to bring some people to experience this. We are willing to bet that you've gotten a little flat here on the Sunday experience. We're like, okay. And they said, and when new people do come, we're just willing to bet that the next steps aren't clear for them. So they come, but they're like, I don't know what to do Um, because you ask one person and they say, you should go to Faith Bridge 101. You ask another person, you should get in a grow group. You ask another person, you should get in a serve team. You ask another person, we need you out in the parking lot. And they're like, oh my gosh, there's just all these things. I can't figure out like what's my next step Um, because they said you're not making that clear to them. We are like, yeah. They said, but you, you clearly... Back in the day, you had this friend-to-friend thing going on. You described for us, they said, how you would do clever little things like you'd send them out on Sundays with these little business cards and you'd say go to Starbucks and go to, go to McDonald's and pay it forward and leave the little card for the, for the you know, server to give to the next person and say, hey, they paid for you, but they left this card and it says Faith Bridge and here's our service times. And you would do these sorts of things and there was excitement around, there's this buzz that was going on in the community because of what was going on. And then they would come on Sundays and the experience was powerful. Sure, it was in a school for many years and then it moved over here. Um, but there was something that was happening that were like, wow, that is really awesome. And then you had clear next steps. What were the next steps? You talked about um, worship plus two. And then um, later we changed it to, to grow plus two. And, and, but the conclusion we reached through this process was today... That feels like marriage to the person on the first date. They're like, whoa, you want me to like come over to somebody's house and start telling my story? And, I don't, that is just, that, that's not really where I'm at. They're like, what, what are your, that's a, that's a great goal. But what are your steps to get them there? Like, what are your baby steps? We say we don't have any baby steps. We don't believe in that stuff. They're like, yeah, you need to start believing in some baby steps. And you've got to start putting some, some stuff out there because you're seeing evidence they're not getting there. Okay? We're like, yeah, you've really said some important things. We're, we're listening. Um, and so they said, okay, who is your one? What do you mean who is our one? Like the 99 and the one? Describe your one. We're like, well, anybody who doesn't have Jesus. They're like... Yeah, but you know, you, um, if you shoot for everything, it, it's going to be hard to really hit anything. Why don't you, if you, if we, if we just would go ahead and, and try to make a target and just say, okay, that's kind of the bullseye. Then you'll, you will still hit everything, but at least now the arrows are getting like onto 
a target and you can, you can it's, it's instead of just flying through space, you know, because you're just out shooting bows and arrows at nothing. And they said, so why don't we drill into this? Who have you tended to reach the best? We said, well, we tend to reach suburbanites. Yeah, that makes sense. You're in the suburbs. What do they like? Well, they like status. They care about their status. Um, they care about success. They care about their kids' success a lot, right? They're very kid-centered. But they enjoy fun. I mean, they like having barbecues and, um, you know, um, the, what do you call the fish things? Boil, um, that's it. And, um, and they like camaraderie. Um, and they want comfort. So we're, we're listing out these things that I've just articulated and they said, right, and, and who seems to be the sweet spot of who you start with? This person. Okay. Um, they said, now, what do you think about that person? Well, instinctively, we, some of us are inclined to say, superficial. And they're like, yeah, see, that's going to have to change because you're going to have to realize Jesus loves that person. Remember what T.A. said a week or two ago? He said, you can't get mad at people who aren't gospel people, who aren't saved for acting unsaved. You can't expect them to think Christianly if they're not Christians. Um, and you can't be in, in, impatient with them and, and um, you know, holier than thou about that. You, you got you to go after them. That's what Jesus said we do, right? So they broke us into teams and said, okay, here's what we're going to give you an assignment to do. We want you to build three teams. We're going to call one team the evangelism team um, or the friend-to-friend -friend team. We're going to call one team the, uh, the next steps. Whoops, next steps team or the assimilation um, and then we're going to talk about we, we want you to have a, a worship sort of the, the whole Sunday experience and we want you to think of this as like dials and you're turning you need to start turning the dials to the right you, you've, you've got to start you, you, you just you haven't cranked any of the dials um, and so we're like, okay, this is exciting. And so they commissioned us to form these teams, not just only staff. Some of you right here are on those teams, and you've already been sitting in meetings, and you've been doing the brainstorming and all that sort of stuff. And it's really exciting what is coming out of it. I sat in one of those meetings this past week just to kind of hear what was going on. And it's, it's really good stuff. Let's start over here. Um, we're calling these our win teams. What? is next. Um, so the, the, the Sunday experience team will, will sort of divide into, um, into half. It's kind of like really two teams. They said, we're going to recommend that you take a serious look at your facilities. Not that you need a lot of new facilities, but you do need a little spiffing up. You've, you've been in this building uh, 11 years. We've walked the campus. We smelled the campus. Um, your Cinecourt West smells bad. We're like, <laughs> smells like home to me, you know. And they're like, now nah, you're gonna have to trust us. It smells like a gym. It it doesn't. It's not a good smell. You got to start digging into this stuff. And your carpet is tired. And what if we just got rid of the carpet and did stained concrete and had some kind of wood stuff and maybe the little orange circular things we just sort of said, you know, that was really good back then and, and started doing some new furniture and just doing some updating to kind of get the house ready. So there, there's that house or that team. And then the other one is the Sunday experience uh, team, to, like with the, the, the music and the worship and everything. At which point they said, now, clearly, you're, you're, you've already been doing, turning that knob a little bit. Um, what's been going on about that? I had to say, okay, give them credit where credit's due. Um, I took a trip over to uh, Passion City Church, Louis Giglio's church, where our own 
homegrown Ben Stewart is, and was exposed to just like, so this is how we're doing it these days. And, <clears throat> and Ben has really kind of been behind the scenes coaching me and us, especially when he's been here. And essentially Ben uh, said to us, look, um, there's no question your heart is in the right place in what you're trying to do musically and what you're trying to do in worship, your heart is in the right place. And I love this place, and of course he does, he's been here 19 years. But maybe it's not connecting to the person of today as well. Like, probably, obviously, clearly, that's the case. So he said, okay, so let me just tell you something that Louis has really kind of helped me to come in into awareness of. A disjointed service is a boring service. If you have eight components of the service that are just like blocks sitting out on a table, but there's no thread that's hooking together, it's just, there's nothing to fasten into. That's just, that's just a boring experience. I said, okay, how do you hook them together? He said, you hook it together with music. He said, so, he said, what if um, the, you're, you're, you're worshiping? And he said, and also, what if we beefed up the, the like, let's add some musicians just to bring some extra energy. Um, and because these are pretty big stages, let's add some energy. Some of you are like, I've been noticing there's more people up there. I'm liking that. And that's not accidental, okay? And um, so he was, Ben was like, yeah, let's maybe just add, you know, turn the knob a little bit, turn the dial, add some people, add some energy. And then what if we started to try to hook it together um, with this thread of music um, so that there's really the whole experience um, like you move from music into some prayer time and let's turn the dial on prayer. That was always our bread and butter. Let's go back to some more meaningful prayer times. Some of you have been saying lately, I've been noticing, I really like the prayer time. It's a little different every week. Yep, that's not accidental. I've been trying to kind of turn the dials a little bit. And, and what if there's like music that's just kind of holding the whole thing together? Um, and even um, through the announcements or the plugs, there's still just, the, you know, it's not like a disjointed thing. You know, who are you? How did you stumble out here to start talking to us? No, nope, this is all part of the whole thing. Um, and there's some music that's, that's just laying a pad in underneath that. And then you move into the message. And then subtly, as the message is coming in for a landing, there's even music that's holding that together. And we're moving back into worship. We're like, Sounds great. Could you like show us how to do this? So Ben did that for the first time when he was here over the summer. He said, yeah, let me just show you how we do that. And it worked. And so we've been, you know, working at it and, and experimenting with kind of setting these dials. And Now, let me explain to you, okay, and this is where I need your help. Whenever you start turning dials, sometimes you're going to accidentally go, and, and just crank it way too far, you know. And so one week somebody came out and they were like, oh, I don't know if I can stand it. And, you know, it's just so loud. And we're like, yep, well, you got new soundboards for one thing. And so we really are adjusting the dials. And so, like, don't give up yet. And, you know, and then we said, you know, why don't we, why don't we beam up the lights just a little bit, just a little haze, you know. But the first week it was like, <laughs> That might be a little much haze, you know, let's turn that, you know, and so, so we're, we're working on it, okay? And this is where I just need your help as influencers to, to not go, what the heck is, to say, you know, they're just working on dialing it in, and they're not quite there. And, um, but one thing's for sure, it ain't boring anymore, right? And, and, and many of you are like, it's really kind of getting exciting, because you never know exactly what's going to happen. And, we're, and, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. And so <clears throat> this is the, uh, the worship experience. And then um, going back, we, um, let's, let's, let's build in some, some next steps that aren't like, yep, you better get over to this house of these strangers that... They're going to love you, trust us. And uh, they meet on Thursdays. And, you know, and, 
people are like, mm, I don't think so. Yeah, so what we're talking about is, is like one thing that we're talking about is this thing that we're going to call maybe party on the patio that's right out there um, where new people get a little ticket from their ushers or the greeters. And hey, you got to go to party on the patio. That's where you can meet uh, some people and, and this sort of thing. And then maybe a few weeks later, you get invited to fajitas in the foyer and you get a backstage pass. And... <laughs> And, you know, we can kind of show them the deal. And then the next week, you know, they get bagels in the bathroom. And, and, and <laughs> not really, not really. I'm just kidding. Um, and so, but we're talking about just, you know, how can we kind of make a breadcrumb trail to, to help people m- to the point where now the thought of getting into a grow group and a serve team, and work, th- that is a doable deal. We're believing as we get this dial turned right, and this dial turned right that then people are like, man, I was just thinking of these friends. I need to bring them to this experience because they need to just experience what is going on here. That comes full circle to even like this coming Sunday. Um, they helped us, um, you know, assess. You've kind of done your, your, your 4th of July thing clearly got so big and kind of almost dangerous and there was weapons. And so we were like, mm done with the four, you know, but they're like, but you have to have some, some new things. So we're experimenting this Sunday with the fall fun day Sunday, right? And wait till you hear the things that we're talking about doing for Christmas. Um, just to try to, to grab hold of the low hanging fruit in the community where people are kind of saying, if they had any spiritual in- interest whatsoever, that's, this might be something that I'd be interested in going and, and being a part of so that our people will be back out there doing friend to friend and bringing them in, right? And so um, maybe this can give you a little idea of um, some of what we've been spending days working on. And like I said, we're, we're not done with it. There's still a lot of creative things that are going on behind the scenes. But I wanted you to just sort of come behind the curtain and realize, okay, it's not just that you know, all craziness is breaking loose. There really is something that's happening here um, that we're really working on and really praying a lot about and asking God to guide us along as we are trying to gear up for doing ministry in 2020, which is just different than it was in 1998, right? And so now, let me kind of move to the last thing I'll I'll say, and then I want to move into the worship and prayer time. So God in his providence is so good, and he knows me so well that um, he knows I could be prone just with this much to fixate on the one, but to forget why the one and then the one just becomes the thing I'm fixated on, and it just becomes a project. We've got to reach the one. We've got to reach the one. But why? What's the heart behind reaching the one? And so the providence of God has just been working, taking me to these places, like over to Passion this spring. And then um, about six weeks ago, I was flying to Denver for a prayer conference. And I couldn't, I'm sitting on the airplane like, I don't even remember when I signed up for this prayer conference. Why am I going to this prayer conference? It seemed like a good idea at the same time. And, and so I figured, well, I know, Lord, you'll do something. And, and so I got there. And, and the sessions were interesting and, and, and were good. And there were some good prayer times. But the, the, the kicker really for me was the evening session of the last night. And Jim Simula came from the Brooklyn Tabernacle um, to speak to us and I've always been a fan of him ever since that book fresh wind fresh fire and just all the prayerful emphasis of that church and um and he got up and he began to talk and I'm sitting up in the balcony and and interested and eager to hear what he's saying and um it didn't take very long before the anointing of the Holy Spirit just began to um settle in the room and settle in my heart and he began talking about how at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, we are all about evangelism. We are all about reaching. He didn't say the one, but that's essentially what he was saying, which was fresh on my mind. He said, and the, re- and the way that we do it is through our choir. 
that is, that's our bait. That's our baited hook because we got the best choir in the whole world, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And he said, we, just, we get thousands of people in every weekend. And we get them in the room and we lock the door and we get them the gospel. And, and we're all laughing. And, and he says, but here's the thing. We got to remember, why are we trying to reach that lost person? And he took us to 1 Thessalonians 2. And he was talking about how in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians, hey, don't you remember how much I love you? I was right there with you, and I cared so much for you. I didn't even take your money. I took money from other churches, so I wouldn't be a burden to you. And I, it was as if, to use a word picture, I, I put you up like a mother to the breast. I, 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 I loved you that much just to feed you and to help you come along. And Jim Cimbala said, that right there, preachers, is the reason Paul got through to the Thessalonians. He loved them that much. Who does that remind you of? It reminds us of Jesus. And he said, now, let me tell you the, the, the struggle that we have, pastors. We get so focused on doing the ministry but not loving the people that we're ministering to. At this point, I'm sitting up at the balcony. I'm like, oh, God, just call me for it. I'm ready. You know, let's have the invitation because I'm, I'm really feeling convicted and touched and it's powerful. And, and, <clears throat> and he said, but when we love the way that Paul loved, the message gets through. And the anointing comes upon our ministry and powerful things happen. And then he said, but look, I get it. The Lord has to remind me of this from time to time. And then he told us this story that I'm going to close with. He said it was Easter several years ago. And at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, we have long services, he says. Our services go like two hours, two and a half hours. So our Easter services are like 9 a.m., noon, 3, 6, you know. And they have you know, 5,000 people. You know, and so it's, it's like huge. And he said it's just been this amazing day. And God has worked all throughout Easter. It's just, you know, awesome. He said, by 8, 8.30 at that last service, I give the invitation. And I am so tired. He said, I'm so exhausted. I'm just like ready to go home and just fall in bed. Because I've been on my feet. I've been preaching. I've been doing ministry all day long. And he says, and, and right here at the end of that day, I see this guy coming towards me. And he's a bum. He said, I'll just call him what, what he, I mean, we got a lot of them. He said, the Brooklyn Tab. And he said, he's, he's walking through, his hair is all matted up. And, and he said, he got about six feet away from me. And he said, the odor just was the most repulsive smell I had ever smelled in my whole life. He said, I, I gasped, oh my gosh. Because clearly he'd been out just in the street, just lying in urine and vomit. And, and here he was. And he's, he said, uh, Jim Cimbala said, at that point, I was like, God, really? Do we have to end this glorious day with this? He wants money. We have a system for that here, a protocol. I don't have the energy to tell him you need to go and, and meet with this person. We got to find out if you're legit and all of this. And Hunt, he said, so I just reached in my wallet and I started to pull out a 10. And, and, and the guy looked at me and he, and I was just getting ready to just give him a 10. Just, just go. Just, here's what you want. And he said, and the guy looked at me and he said, I didn't come down here for money. And he said, well, what did you come down here for? He said, well, I sat up there in the balcony after I heard the music in here. And so I just came in. And then I heard you telling all about this man named Jesus. And I... Then you said, come down here if you want to have Jesus in your life. And so I came down here because I want to have Jesus. And at this point, Jim Simula said, he starts sobbing. He's just like, oh, my gosh, I'm a sinful pastor and just trying to pay him off. And, and so the, the guy who smells so bad, he sees Jim Simula crying. And so he steps up to him and he puts his arms around him. <laughs> And he starts crying with him. And Simbala said, I could tell the Holy Spirit was working in his life, even as he was working in my life. 
he was correcting me and he was saving him. And he said, in that moment, it was as if his odor just became the most pleasant smell I had ever smelled in my whole life. And he said, I felt the Lord say through that, this is how every single person smells to me. And I need you to love them all the same. And he said, so we got him taken care of for that night. The next week, he, he had no teeth. He said, we got him some dental work so he could get some teeth. Soon after, he said, we hired him for some custodial, custodial work around the church and gave him a job. And then um, at Christmas time, he said, that we, we had him to our home. And he said, he, he came and he brought me a gift. He said he, he, he brought me a handkerchief, and he, he didn't even have it wrapped up right. He said he just had it in a piece of tissue paper with a piece of scotch tape. And he said, it's the sweetest handkerchief I ever got in my life. And he said, but we continued to work with him, and he grew in his discipleship. And over time, he said he became a pastor. And today, he's a pastor to many other people. He said, now, go back. What had to get right in my heart for all of that to happen? Love. Well, at this point, I really was sitting up at the balcony. I was like, the three teams and everything. Now, I, that's the reason you flew me to Denver. Because it's the one thing that I, I, I needed yet to have very clear. And that is, the heart for all of this which is the same heart that Jesus has for us. Because this is why he gave us the church. He said, now I want you to go out and I want you to get more of the ones out there. And he's loved us and called us to love them, to bring them in. And so now you know a little bit more about what's been going on and why I could not be more excited about where we're going in the days ahead. Why don't we pray? And then we're going to move into some worship and prayer time. Lord, thank you for the clarity that comes um, in a season like this season. You've been doing a great thing. There's wisdom that's found in the counsel of many. You've been giving us such good insights. And in some ways, we've cranked the knobs too far and had to go back. And, but we're trying, Lord, because we want to get it right. And we want to help our people to rediscover that first love for you that sends them running out, uh, focused on the number ones out there, the lost people out there in the community, not just on our own fellow 99s who we love and know and feel safe with and study the Bible with, but so we get back to what we always did do so well. I feel like, Lord, in a very real way, you've brought me out of my own sleepwalking here in the last half year, and you're bringing now our whole church out of our own collective sleepwalking. And I'm excited for it and thankful, God. And I'm just asking in Jesus' name that you would visit us with power, that you would do a tremendous work in the coming five years. And that it all be for your glory. And I'm asking it all in Jesus' name. You know, um, one of the things that we did a lot of at the conference that I was telling you about is this scripture-fed, spirit-led, worship-based prayer. I want to just lead us in our final minutes through just a little bit of that. I want to use the, the rhythm or the movements of the Lord's Prayer. There's five distinct movements in the Lord's Prayer, which make for a nice template. You notice at the start, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is he talking about there? Hallowed be thy name? He's talking about worship. He's talking about praise. 
That's a good place for us to start as a congregation. That's a good place for us to start every day in our own personal devotions, right? Just praising the Lord for who he is and thanking him for what he's done. Let me read to you um, from Chronicles 29, 1 Chronicles 29. Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. Oh, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people here that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you've first given to us. We're here only for a moment, visitors and strangers in this land of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like passing shadows, gone soon without a trace. But God, you're the God of our ancestors. Abraham and Isaac and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. See to it that our love for you never changes. And then he said to the whole assembly, give praise to the Lord your God. And the entire assembly praised the Lord and the God of their ancestors. And they bowed low and they knelt before him, the Lord and the king. Why don't we start off by standing and just moving into a time of praising and worshiping right now as Matthew and Lizzie lead us in this moment. so great Jesus in all things I have seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I'll be singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you enough you are the Lord Shining all the stars in glory Your love is like the wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Creation calls all to the Savior We are alive for your praise In earth and sky Us. 
not to us, but to your name. We lift up all, because you are worthy, God, not to us, not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise, not to us, but to time you are, you are the Lord Almighty. You're outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest oceans. Oh, nothing else compares. Now, why don't you be seated and let's move into that second uh, moment where Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What is that? In a nutshell, that's surrender. That's surrender. What is it in your heart that needs surrender? Without which you're, you're never going to function with the anointing. Some of you, you say, you know, it's skepticism. I need to su surrender my skepticism or my cynicism or an addiction or phoniness or laziness or fear or just all sorts of things. Why don't you just close your eyes right now and I'll ask you to do something that just sort of physical, just maybe close your hands and inside your hand put whatever it is that you hold on to because, you know, we hold on to these things and we convince ourselves, I can love God and walk closely with God and I can hang on to this at the same time, and it doesn't work. It blocks the flow of his Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you in the quietness of this moment, as the Lord gives you grace to do so, why don't you surrender that and just open up your hand and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to surrender this to you. I'm going to trust that you are good that you're great, even as we were just singing. You're the Lord Almighty. And so I'm going to surrender this to your care now. Whatever it is, you do that now.
sing that again. I surrender all. Oh, and I surrender all. Help us, Jesus. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread. What's he talking about here? He's talking about our asking coming and just asking the Lord for what it is that we need, which is always going to revolve around one of two things. It's either going to revolve around resources or relationships. That will cover everything. Sometimes it's home stuff, money stuff, food stuff, budget stuff, work stuff, or it's relationships, spouse stuff, children stuff, someone at work stuff. And so... Um, influencers, I, I want to spend a few minutes um, coming to God with our requests. And the way I'm going to ask you to do this is I'm going to ask you to uh, couple up with someone. Many of you came with a spouse, so you can just do that with your spouse. Others of you, don't, not yet, you don't have to like look around and start figuring it. Let me, let me tell you what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to, to find a person and I want you to experiment with something we've been experimenting with as a staff. And that is, I want you to, because we're going to keep it moving, to say in about two sentences, maybe three, here's how you could pray for me. You don't have time to give the whole backstory and it all started, you know, seven years ago. You can't do that. Just here's how you could pray for me in two or three sentences. And then I want the other person, I want you to pray and Something that takes the, uh, I don't know, the fright or the scariness out of praying aloud, if that's something that you haven't done before, is I'm going to limit everybody. You get two sentences, two sentence prayer, okay? So those of you who pray in paragraphs and chapters, you don't get to do it tonight. <laughs> two sentences. You're going to have to really measure your words. And then I'm going to ask you to flip it around and the other person you share in about two or three sentences, here's how you could pray for me. And the other of you, in two or three sentences, I want you to pray for that person right now. We're going to move right on. Let's, let's do that. You can stand or you can keep your seat however you like. Let's do that right now. Okay, now you should be on the other person, sort of flipping it over by now. It's who I am. 
And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know it's what we need before we say. Why don't you be seated again? At this point, Jesus moves to forgiveness, right? Because somewhere along the way, when we've been worshiping God, when we've been surrendering to him, when we've been lifting up our requests, the thought comes to our mind, something's not right here, and here's what it's about. And he said, yep, that was the next thing I wanted to get to because that's going to always stand in between our, our relationship. And so he says, time to ask forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so there's a asking for forgiveness and there's a giving forgiveness at the same time. Maybe somebody's wronged you and it's come time for you to say, I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to take him off my meat hook and I'm going to let it go. Right here in this silent moment, why don't you just do some confessing to the Lord of what it might be that stands between you and a vibrant relationship with him, something that you need to just confess and ask his grace and forgiveness to cover. Or maybe it's somebody that you need to forgive. And he said, I keep bringing this up and you keep holding the grudge. You won't let it go. And then you can't figure out how come spiritually you're not growing. This is the thing. You've got to let go of this. Why don't you do that even right now in this quiet moment?
hearts are turning. Lead us into freedom. We lift up a song to the saving one. We are coming back, Lord, leaving what we've loved more. There is nothing better than your love. Open wide our ears, Lord, teach our hearts to our prayer not our will but your will change our hearts Lord teach us to love what you love sing this together may your kingdom come and your will be done may we love what you love sing that again may your kingdom come and your will be done May we love what you love, or oh, change us, Lord. May your kingdom come and your will be done. May we love what you love, Lord. May your kingdom come and your will be done. May we love what you love. he comes to the very end. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What's he talking about here? He's talking about victory. He's talking about protection. Because there's not a one of us who gets through this life, who gets through a day, through many times an hour Nobody gets a pass on this. The enemy is always about stealing and killing and destroying. And he's saying, this is a good way to end your prayer moment. Just to say, now God, when I face him, because I know I will, we all do. Nobody gets a pass. Won't you deliver me? Won't you give me victory? Won't you protect me? Won't you give me success? Because your good brings us full circle to where we were. 
because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And that's where we started, talking about what a great God he was, he is, and praising him for who he is and for the things that he's done. And so I think it'd be appropriate for us to finish tonight by standing back and let's just praise him because he is able to deliver us and to give us the victory. Let's sing that one. Let's stand up and sing one last one together. Amen. Hey, you guys, thanks so much for being here tonight. I know we kept you nine minutes late, but I hope that uh, it was worth it. I think it was a great night, and I'm grateful for you being here. There's lots of Chick-fil-A left. Take a bag on your way out to your kids or for yourself. Go in peace. Thanks for all you do, influencers. Thanks for being here. You're dismissed. <laughs>